in running your research. Today's uh, webinar is similar. We'll be diving into the work of four amazing research groups that have turned the pandemic into an opportunity for their research. If you've got any questions, please use the Q&A uh, function at the bottom of your screen. So it's next to the chat. There should be a Q&A function. Then you can ask questions and then the, um, the researchers can also respond to you individually if they need to, or they can bring up your questions during their talk because I'll be scanning them and going, oh yes, I can, br I can bring that answer into my question as I speak. So now, to, while we're do it, while we're chatting with you today, I want you to keep one final thing in your mind. Let me share my screen again. When, when, whenever we're running research projects, there are always these four different phases we go through. There's the design phase, there's a the build phase, there's the running it, collecting your data from your participants, and then the analysis phase. Think about what the researchers are telling you in terms of the hints and tips and their challenges and successes at each of these four stages. You might be in the design phase now and be benefiting from those insights, but you're going to be getting to the building or the running stage and the analysis stage next. When people are running participants, how did you manage your participants? What did you do with them? How did you incentivize them? You'll have um, tidbits and hints and tips at all of these four stages. So keep this framework in mind as you take notes. So with that, I'm going to go back to the palace today. We've got Shane, who has been shaping Irish government messaging. Lucy, who's been investigating the, COVID, the cognitive effects of COVID and long COVID. Melissa, who's been co combating COVID misinformation with a game. And Max, who's been researching the lived experience of the COVID pandemic and how it has changed our sense of selves. Um, so right now we're going to go first of all to Shane, who's going to tell us about his research. Great. Uh, thanks, Joe. Can I just check that people can see uh, those slides? I can see your slides, yes. All right, good. Um, great. Um, so yeah, I'm a researcher at the uh, Economic and Social Research Institute in Dublin, Ireland. Since March 2020, we've been doing quite a lot of COVID work. So it kind of became like 80, 90 percent of our, our research, um, particularly over 2020, 2021. Um, today I'm going to talk a bit about how we went about engaging in rapid online research uh, and all of this is to inform policy. Uh, just by means of background about the, the team that I work with, so the, the Behavioural Research Unit, it's headed up by uh, Pete Lon and Deirdre Robertson um, uh, and I'm also a permanent member of the, the research staff. Um, we have two postdocs, Ilva, or Orga and Phelim and then two research assistants, Alex and Ilva. We have different backgrounds, so some of us are psychologists, some of us are uh, economists, and generally what we do is we uh, use behavioural science to inform policy. So the ESRI is a public body, we're publicly funded, but importantly we're independent from the government and our mission is to provide evidence um, for policy. And we do that for a host of public bodies, um, government departments uh, and internationally as well. Generally, our research timeline, so this is kind of how we work um, day to day or the different projects that we have, that we might get a brief from a funder or we might be applying to a specific research grant. We'll come up with our initial proposal. We might spend a week or two on it and have kind of a, a whiteboard session with the team, um, get our thoughts together, write our, our short proposal um, for the funders. If we're successful with that, then we will spend four weeks, maybe even up to two months on the experimental design, getting it, what we call the instrumentation down. So that's the, the kind of materials, the, the questions that people are going to see. There's a lot of back and forth in that stage, um, often with the funders as well, um, kind of towards the end to make sure that we're, we're going to be able to answer the questions that they're interested in. Um, before the pandemic, programming would have taken quite a long time. So we, we kind of ran a lot of um, experiments in the lab. So we would have coded these ourselves, had people come in, the, Data, whoa, I've just skipped to the end there. So you're getting the, um, sorry, you're getting the, the punchline already. Uh, so I'll just go back to this slide. The data collection phase for us before the pandemic, so that was run completely in person. It would take probably two months, maybe three months uh, to collect maybe 100, 200 responses um, when we were running these, these studies online. We would then analyze the data, uh, put together a slide deck. Um, so that's how we kind of initially engage with the policymakers to get some feedback on it before we write the report. Um, typically then a research project could last anywhere between 10 to 12 months. So that's that's kind of how we went about things before the pandemic and sort of getting back to that now. But I will say that because of how much experience we gathered as a team during the pandemic, that programming and data collection phase has gotten much, much shorter, thankfully. 
when it came to doing our uh, research for COVID, however, the, the timeline looked slightly different. Um, so we got the brief from the funder. So this uh, was the expert advisory group um, here in Ireland that was informing the pandemic response. We'd have our initial proposal back to them very quickly about what we might do. We would then set about the experimental design and instrumentation probably within the next week. Um, and in parallel with that, someone would be programming. So we would kind of design different stages of the experiment pass it through different members of the team, then there'd be another kind of uh, group, of the, a, a kind of subgroup of the team who would be leading the programming side of things on Gorilla. Um, we'd be selecting some tasks to go into the, the questionnaire function if we don't need as much sort of control over it. Um, and then other tasks we would code ourselves in, in the task builder. Um, and we found that kind of really, really um, sped things up. Um, but we kind of segment the process then between like different stages of, of the experiment um, and then they'd be programmed and tested while other ones were being programmed and so on. So it was very much a sort of collaborative effort with, with stages running in parallel. The data collection then we'd collect uh, responses from um, kind of between 500 to 1000 people. Um, we engage with market research agencies. So people are paid um, kind of at least the minimum wage, similar to how, how prolific is. Um, this meant we had uh, access to nationally representative samples. And yet usually this would take um, to about up to a week, two weeks, which is obviously kind of a far cry away from our two months to get a quarter of that sample. Um, while the data was collecting, we would typically pre-register our analyses so that we are ready to go as soon as the data comes in. Um, and we can get that slide deck together um, quickly for the policymakers. So that all of this, instead of taking about 10 months, happened in about four to eight weeks for these initial COVID experiments that, that we were on. Um, how we managed to, to do this um, very much helped by having a team of highly skilled and motivated researchers. Um, there's a lot of weekend work, particularly during the early stages of the pandemic. We had access to those nationally representative panels, which is clearly important if you're going to inform a, a policy response for an entire country. Um, but then we also had the tools for quickly programming online studies. So that's where we found kind of engaging with Gorilla to be helpful. Thankfully, and we're grateful that we had um, already transitioned to doing some experiments online beforehand, but it was very much a sort of slow process to try to get used to. Um, but then with the, the pandemic, the need to kind of, and the, the demand for these studies to be run um, quickly meant that we, we kind of really upskilled quickly in this and, and being able to kind of use Gorilla um, in particular over the time was, was incredibly helpful. Um, I've left my kind of timeline as long as um, the previous one, because in general, the paper did take a lot longer to, to come out. Um, so we had quite a lot of um, quite a lot of work that would kind of run on. We'd, we'd kind of finish one experiment and while the other one had started. So it kind of took a while to get to that paper writing stage, um, particularly when we built up to four or five different experiments. Uh, but most of the papers are um, available now, thankfully. So to summarize some of the experiments that we've done um, about COVID-19, so these were funded by the Department of Health in Ireland and the Department of the Taoiseach, which is our uh, Prime Minister's office. Uh, so since late March 2020, we, we um, initially put together a review of the behavioural literature, and then we ran experiments on social distancing, self-isolation, public expectations for how restrictions would be lifted initially, um, their perceptions of the exit strategy. We pre-tested uh, our contact tracing app, we compared public and expert risk perceptions, understanding of the cost of test and trace system. We did stuff on social desirability, more on self-isolation. We've done stuff on vaccine hesitancy. More recently, we've done stuff on uh, rapid antigen tests, or I think they're called the lateral flow tests in the UK. And we've also been running, uh, using Gorilla, a social activity measure uh, that's been running every two weeks since January. Uh, just looking at the kinds of things that people are doing and how that relates to perceptions as well. That's less of an experiment, um, but still, um, still one that we're using uh, Gorilla for. So I'm going to talk about uh, the experiment we did, just kind of a couple of stages of it, um, uh, which compared public and expert risk perceptions of social interactions. Uh, this was done when my team was slightly different. So we have Cameron Belton, who's now at Ofgem, um, Hannah Julianne, who's at the SAI, Martina Baryakova, who I saw was in the in the chat there. So she's doing her PhD on risk perceptions. And I think some of this, some of her PhD was actually motivated by this experiment in particular. Um, and then also Kieran Lavin, um, who is now traveling the world. Um, so I do want to kind of call out to these people because um, it really, really was a collaborative effort um, with all of these uh, experiments and, and it kind of did take a lot of motivation from people. Um, so the experiment that we did, so it looks at perceptions of COVID-19 risk. At the time, there was quite a lot of um, papers coming out on how risky people perceived COVID-19 to be. 
but it was more in the general sense. So um, kind of how worried are you about COVID-19 in general? What we were interested in is the are the specific factors in social settings that influence people's perception of risk. So I might have the same uh, overall perception of risk as Joe, uh, but we might make different decisions in terms of what we're going to do, depending on the different risk factors that we're paying attention to. So if, for example, Joe cares more about being inside uh, or outside, and I care more about the number of people that are going to be around, we might end up going to different places and putting ourselves at different levels of risk, even if our overall level of worry is the same. So that's the, the motivation um, for the study. There was a multiple stages to it that I won't go through them all. The first is a very straightforward open text question. So that was just, what do you think about when you're judging your, your, um, the risk of contracting COVID in different social settings? The more kind of, uh, in the one that kind of was more involved was uh, we asked people to rate different uh, social settings. I'm gonna show you some examples of those. We asked people to rate different factors. We presented people with vignettes. Um, so these are the kind of the, the main experiment that, that we ran. It was completed by a nationally representative sample of uh, 800 people. I think this one took about five days for the data collection. Um, but one element of this that I think um, particularly strengthened that was that we also had an expert sample complete some of the same tasks. So these were experts in virology, in public health. Uh, many of them were, in, were on other expert advisory groups at the time in, in forming the government response. So these were people who were kind of really clued into how, how COVID transmits. We got them to, you'll, you'll notice it's a smaller sample, but uh, we did get them to complete the same tasks. One of the reasons that this was necessary is because we ran this study in sort of May, June, 2020. At the time, there wasn't really much out there in terms of what really affects um, COVID transmission. So we didn't really have a benchmark for what the right answers are. So for this study, we're going to use the experts as our benchmark and, and see then where the gaps are um, in risk perceptions between the public and the experts. Um, straightforwardly on the open text task, well, I say straightforwardly for the results. The open text task involved um, Martina and Kieran both coding two and a half thousand open text responses into different categories, and we, we pre-registered the, the categories beforehand. Um, I'm going to show you some of them here. So the, the lighter the shade of it, the kind of the lower down the list people mentioned it. So um, we're saying here that if, if people, for example, mentioned it first, then it's the most cognitively available factor to them. Um, just as a sort of high level, you can see that the experts kind of mentioned the number of people slightly more often than uh, the public did. But where those differences emerged more strongly were with things like location. So the experts were more likely to immediately reference, okay, whether it's indoors or outdoors or what the ventilation is like. And this was in the early summer 2020. Um, duration wasn't mentioned by too many people, but again, there was more experts mentioning how long the interaction took place. Distancing, however, was one where there was very little difference there between the public and experts. And you'll see the public were actually going to, were more likely to mention that first. Um, so whether they were able to maintain social distance from other people. Um, this one, when I was looking at the chart again, kind of struck me as a bit odd. I was like, wait, less than 20% of people mentioned anything to do with masks. But this again was the kind of in the context of the time of the study, this was summer 2020. Um, so masks were kind of only coming on board. And we also um, looked for references of hygiene. The take home here was that the public are thinking less about whether they're meeting others indoors or outdoors or somewhere with good ventilation. Where we see this a bit more in depth is with our rating task. Um, so here there's a description of a social activity. So um, we describe a situation where you can keep two meters from other people. Or sorry, it's two, keeping two meters from other people is quite difficult. You stay for two to four hours, everyone is indoors and there are about 14 other people from different households. And you just asked how risky do you think that would be for you? We present people with multiple of these scenarios, uh, but what we did on the first page, because everyone is going to have a different interaction with this sort of scale, um, we try to kind of calibrate people to the scale with two items that were on the first page for everyone. One of them was face-to-face -face contact with someone um, who has COVID-19, you stay for four to six hours, they're not engaging in any mitigative behaviors and you've no prote protective equipment. So most people should be going extremely risky on that scale. The other one is an online meeting with other people. Um, it's only by video call, so that one should be at the other end, so not at all risky. Um, one of the benefits of doing that, so it, it calibrated people to the scale, but we could also use it as an attention check. So one of the kind of risks that people talk about with online research is people paying attention to it. So here we could quickly see whether people were just clicking randomly or whether they paid attention to the details on it. Um, and then we varied those four factors on the other on the other items. So um, you can see in the last one, for example, you're still there for two to four hours, but this time everyone is outside. 
there's a lot more people, but it's easy to keep social distance. So how, how risky do you think that is? So because of the setup of the experiment, we can see how people weight these different factors when they're evaluating the risk in different settings. And you'll remember we had experts do this as well as our sample of the public. So I'm just going to show you here the average risk rating. Uh, the scores don't matter too much. We're just going to look at the essentially the distance between that zero, um, the distance of, of the barriers from the, the middle uh, zero line there and our different factors. So if we look at the number of people, you can see the pattern is generally the same between the public and experts. And if you remember on our open text task, they were quite close together as well. On location, however, so the pattern is the same, but you can see that the experts are further away from the zero um, for outdoors and for indoors than the public air. So what this suggests is that the experts are putting more weight on location when they're given their ratings. And this is a statistically significant difference um, in the models. And we see similar with duration. So this is also statistically significant, but you can see there's less weight put on it. So there's kind of a lot of weight put on the number of people, quite a bit of weight put on location, particularly for experts, less weight put on duration. But again, it's the experts are thinking more about how long they're there. Distancing, however, you can see the public are really taking into account here social distancing. The experts, it looks like they're doing it less so, but it does depend on what, how it interacts with other factors. And we can look at that as well. The take home here is that the public differentiated between the location and duration factors significantly less than the experts did. Now, because of the setup, we can also look at the, the different interactions. So what happens if there's 100 people meeting for four hours compared to if it's 14 people meeting for four hours and so on? Um, so this, this chart is going to like there's, there's many different elements here that I won't go through um, in too much detail, but I want to draw your attention to just one of the patterns that we see here particularly towards the, the right-hand side of the chart, you'll see the expert bar is much higher than the public bar. Um, particularly any time there's an interaction with one of these high-risk factors, so there being 100 people there, you're there for a long time, distancing is difficult. Anytime that happens indoors, the, the experts are putting more weight on it. So they're nearly kind of engaging in that risk perception multiplicatively, that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts whereas the public are doing so sub-additively. So they think if you're doing one risky thing and another risky thing, it, they don't add up um, necessarily on top of each other, whereas the experts say, okay, I'm doing these two risky things, so that's even more risky. Um, so this is one of the, the kind of findings that we had that didn't directly inform a policy response, but had more theoretical relevance, because here we're seeing that experts are, for some reason, being able to integrate these different risk factors in a different way to members of the public. Okay, so that's a very quick run through of what was a fairly complicated and evolved experiment, and that was only a, a couple of stages of it. Uh, the paper is just recently published in the Journal of Experimental Psychology Applied, so if anyone's interested in, in reading it there, um, and you'll see the, the kind of the long list of co-authors because it really was um, a, a collaborative effort there. Um, the findings then were used to inform communication priorities from the summer, so it was quite clear that distancing had sunk in and reducing your contacts had sunk in. So these were two things that the public had clearly kind of factored into our estimates of risk, how easy it was to socially distance and how many people were there. Location and ventilation um, and the duration of interaction then got more priority in communications, particularly that location and ventilation one, because that was something that the experts had clearly picked up and they were factoring into their decisions far more than members of the public were um, in summer 2020. That's not terribly surprising, given that um, the, the science on COVID was evolving at the time, but it did give policymakers then the, the sort of evidence that was required there for um, communications to be directed in a certain way. So uh, just to kind of sum up, the rapid research for policy was, was absolutely possible. Um, I wouldn't particularly like to go back to being that rapid um, in our research. Um, it is highly dependent on resources. So in terms of people, there was the, the research team involved, as well as um, access to the participants. Uh, but also the tools that were available to us. So we were lucky, I think, at the time to have already had some experience with Gorilla and then being able to kind of um, rely on our, our uh, very adept research assistants to get things programmed very, very quickly. Um, but yeah, happy to, to kind of take any questions on this. We've, the publications and so on are on our uh, website, just esri.ie forward slash brew. I'm happy to take emails and comments and questions and so on. Jane, that's extraordinary. I mean, I find the notion of being able to turn around something in, was it four to eight weeks, is 
you know, given the normal pace of academic research. So I think I find that completely mind blowing. Um, what I'd like everybody who's uh, in the session today in the chat, can you say what 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 was it that you needed to hear today? What did you take away from the Shane, from the talk that just that Shane just gave us? What are you going to take away and apply into your research? Shane, um, I was really struck by this idea of using an expert group as a control for everybody else. I think that's such a clever design. I haven't come across that before. And, I, and I'm going to think on that when I when we're doing sort of research in the future. I think that's really neat. I have one question for you, though. We were seeing that um, experts and the general public responded differently. What what do you think that comes down to? What do you think is the, the ultimate cause of that difference? Yes, yeah, so that's that's really uh interesting question i think particularly uh theoretically i do i did see that there's a question in the q a just asking who who counted as an expert uh, to go over that again so the experts in the sample we had were uh many of them were academic researchers in virology public health um so kind of had expertise in how um diseases transmit uh but quite a large uh, number of them were um from expert advisory groups that were informing uh the nefit which is the national public health emergency team uh in ireland in terms of why there was that difference, particularly in um, with relation to how they integrated the risk, um, one of the things that we investigated was, is it down to education? So the expert sample were kind of more educated than the public sample on average. Um, so to investigate that a bit further, we looked at anyone in the public sample who had a master's degree or higher. Um, so we had just over 100 people in the, in the public sample um, who had a master's degree. And it seemed like they were between the public and the experts in their integration of risk. So there was, uh, so if if I were to plot that chart again, where we looked at the the kind of combination of the the risk factors, that educated subsample just kind of fit linearly in the middle of the two. Um, so we can't say whether it's kind of education or is using that as a proxy for cognitive ability or if it's kind of education coupled with the ability to take on information specifically about the risk. So clearly the experts were quite motivated to learn as much as they could about the risk. But also at the time, the educated subsample were quite motivated to learn about the risk too. We were all living through the pandemic. Um, so that's kind of one of the ways that it's, it's kind of difficult to isolate completely what it is, but I think it's, it's interesting for sort of further work. The other point I'll make is that there's very little research out there on what's called synergistic risk. So how people kind of integrate two risk factors that might interact with each other. Um, so I know that's uh, what Martina will be working on for, for her PhD who's in the chat. So I'll direct questions about that to her rather than me. Brilliant. I, th I think we're going to have to go to Lucy now because I know Melissa's got a tight deadline that she has to make as well. So Lucy, over to you. Can you see my screen? I can. Okay. And everyone else, do please feel, feel free to keep on asking Shane questions in the Q&A, as long as you can also pay attention to Melissa at the same time, and he can answer them uh, as well. Um, uh, but otherwise, follow up with Shane separately. Uh, he is available on Twitter, and he's really friendly. Right, Lucy, over to you. Hello, thank you for inviting me to talk to this about this today. Um, so I'm going to present some uh, research that we did uh, starting in, again in 2020, um, looking at the cognitive impacts of um, COVID infection. Cognitive impacts are not something you normally associate with COVID. Um, obviously, we think of it as a, um, a respiratory disease. Um, but my background is studying the impact of health related things on cognition and memory. And it was sort of summer 2020 when I began to, the increasing amount of reporting on the types of damage and the types of issues that were ha happening in COVID patients, quite, you know, apart from just being sent into ICU and um, being very ill, started to line up with some of the issues that I recognized from my previous research as tending to lead to cognitive deficits. Looking into this more closely, there were a number of reasons to believe that there might be cognitive issues um, in following COVID. And to just briefly review why we thought that might be a thing. So first of all, neurological symptoms. Whilst we all associate COVID with a cough and a fever, um, one, of the th one of the most common things we associate with COVID is loss or change in taste and smell. 
Now that's actually a neurological symptom. That is something going on in the sensory regions of the brain. And actually it's, there's about, um, depending on how severe the issue, the, the illness was and which study you look at, somewhere between 30 and 80% of patients report some kind of neurological symptoms. And these aren't just loss of sense of smell, um, a very common one is headache, limb weakness, um, problems with the visual system, disturbed or um, uh, impaired vision, um, and you know things like um, that are quite reminiscent of stroke symptoms, so uh, slurred or difficulty uh, difficult with speech, um, numbness, um, tingling in the limbs and the extremities, and so on. So there's reason to believe that something's happening in the brain with COVID. And actually there's some evidence of that. So there's quite a lot of evidence that came out early on, um, looking at people who were very severely ill with COVID from ICU or um, looking at um, post-mortem studies. And actually more recently, there's been um, kind of a range of reviews on the kinds of ways in which the, uh, the virus can affect the brain. And most of these come under sort of, if you like, indirect effects. So whilst there is evidence that COVID the virus itself can get into the brain, that doesn't seem to be happening like terribly often. It happens, but it's not like the main way that COVID can affect the brain. The two main ways that we now think that COVID affects the brain more commonly are via neuroinflammation. So the immune system is just an absolute overdrive and it causes everything to become inflamed. And one of the things that can become inflamed is the brain and that affects the way neurons work and communicate. And the other one is via disruption of um, the ability for cells in the brain to get oxygen. And so that can be through breathing difficulties directly. You know, if you're hypoxic, then your brain will be hypoxic, but it also can be through how easily red blood cells can get to areas of the brain via the blood vessels in the brain. So any disruption, so a blockage or a leak in a blood vessel can cause a lack of oxygen in neurons. And more recent research has suggested that indeed, if you look at brain scans of people before and after they've had COVID, there is evidence of reduced grey matter in the brain. Um, and that reduced grey matter particularly concentrates around um, the left temporal lobe, which is where language and memory is particularly um, based. So are there any evidence, you know, that this is kind of neurological um, problems in COVID, but is there any reason to believe that there are cognitive deficits? And again, this is where I was in summer 2020. And the idea that there would be a cognitive side of COVID was was actually almost a joke at the time, you know, everyone was turning their research to COVID and I was like, oh, I study cognition, perhaps we'll look at cognition in COVID. But actually, people started to talk about cognition in COVID because they began to be recognised a condition known as long COVID. And that was this idea that some people, while a lot of people um, recover immediately after their infection, some people don't. And so NICE described post-COVID-19 syndrome as signs or symptoms that develop during or after an acute infection that continue for more than 12 weeks and are not explained by something else. And it's, uh, the ONS now estimates that somewhere around 10 to 25% of people who become infected with COVID have some form of long COVID afterwards. And the research started to come out suggesting that whilst um, the most common symptom of long COVID was fatigue and exhaustion, as you might expect, the second or third or within the top three, depending on the study, most common symptom was cognitive dysfunction. And most of these uh, elements of cognitive dysfunction concentrated around problems with memory, problems with concentration and problems with language. So there's there were a number of reasons to believe that this should be something we should look into, particularly you know, with an expertise in the effect of health conditions on cognition. So there were some outstanding questions. The kind of scientific questions were quite clear. You know, what is the nature of the cognitive impairment? Are um, people who are reporting cognitive issues, are they, you know, is that reflected in objective um, reduced performance on cognitive measures and so on? But there were quite a lot of practical questions as well. It was lockdown. We knew so little about COVID. We didn't know what question to ask. We had to do something. If we were going to do something, we had to do it quickly. So, and you know, uh, looking back on Shane's talk, we were used to doing everything in person. 
we would code our tasks ourselves, we would bring people into the lab. And if you do that, you can do things like blood tests and so on as well. And we couldn't do any of that. So we were very lucky that our department, because research had moved online, our department bought a gorilla license, something <laughs> Joe knows that I had been sort of campaigning for for a while unsuccessfully. So what does this let us do? So one of the things that Gorilla combines is the ability to do both questionnaires and cognitive tasks in the same space. So this allowed us to collect quite detailed demographic data from our participants, as well as infection history and a really complex symptom profile, as well as do cognitive tests. We were on a really short timeline and we didn't know precisely what we were looking for. So we needed a bunch of tasks and we needed them quickly. So the other thing Gorilla allowed us to do with uh, the database of previous research that had been done and kind of sample experiments was to provide a, a you know, especially since we hadn't used Gorilla before, so we didn't know what we were doing, was to adapt a bunch of existing tasks very quickly and easily so that we could get them off, get the study off the ground really, really quickly. There's also some other stuff which I will talk about later. Um, so the COVID and cognition study, to, to summarise it dramatically, um, had four stages within the baseline session. There, there are some follow-ups, I'm not going to go into those, but, but there are. Um, we looked at demographics, we looked at kind of health history, both in terms of general health and in terms of diagnoses and previous conditions. Experience of COVID, including um, comp a quite uh, comprehensive symptom profile, and then a range of cognitive tests. And our final sample was around 180 people who had had COVID and around 180 people who had not. We designed it in consultation with the long COVID support group um, so as to make sure that we tried to cover all the things that were known by the patient community at the time, even if they weren't in the kind of public sphere. And we had a range of cognitive tests. Um, all of these were adapted from stuff that already existed on Gorilla that we could adapt quickly. So we had two memory tests, a word list task and an associative memory task. Um, so word list standard, you see a list of words, then you see a word and was it on the list? The associative memory task, you were shown a series of pairs of words, pairs of pictures, sorry, um, one of which was a food and one of which was an item of stationery. You were then given one item of the pair and had a menu of nine choices of what was paired with it. We also did some executive functions tasks that I won't go into. Uh, and a category fluency task, which we added after consulting with the long COVID patient group, because this is not something we'd thought of, but they said they had word finding difficulties. So we did a naming task where they got a category and they had to come up with as many examples as they could in one minute. We also added in, because it was online, an attention check. So the real effort number counting task was um, a effort slash attention check, where basically they were, had to say how many zeros are in this grid. They didn't need to get it right, but they had three guesses. And what we looked at was, were the three guesses sort of in the ballpark? If they were completely random, then we thought someone wasn't trying. And actually, we didn't have any that were like that, which was really encouraging. So a whistle-stop tour of our results um, was that, as expected, when we looked at those with long COVID, so those currently experiencing symptoms, a large proportion reported cognitive difficulties. So around 80% reported difficulty concentrating, around 70% reported brain fog, similarly forgetfulness, tip of the tongue, which is the uh, inability to come up with, to find a word, um, and semantic disfluency, which is coming up with the wrong word. So you're trying to type and you just say the wrong word. Um, and these were really common. And actually what's, what was um, reassuring was that these percentages are very similar to for those seen in other much larger epidemiological studies, because one of the difficulties with doing in-depth work is that you generally can't get the same sorts of sample sizes, and they're not necessarily as um, representative. The kind of summary finding with the cognitive assessments that was that we indeed found substantial difference between those who had had COVID and those who had not had COVID if we took a factor of the memory performance. So we used factor analysis to combine many tests of the same thing into a single um, a single factor. And so looking at this factor that was memory that combined all of the memory tests, we found a significant um, difference between those that had had COVID and those that hadn't. And that scaled with severity of ongoing symptoms. So people who said I've recovered now were pretty much indistinguishable from people who hadn't had COVID. But people who said, yes, I have ongoing symptoms were um, 
more, were more impaired and more impaired the more severe those symptoms were. We also found that in the naming task, whilst people, it was unclear whether or not they made more mistakes in general, like they did, but not when you controlled for age and sex and location and so on. What was very clear was that people who had had COVID and those with severe ongoing symptoms made more mistakes in terms of repeating themselves. They forgot something they'd said less than 60 seconds ago. We also looked at a range of symptoms. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but we looked at symptoms they experienced during the initial infection, during the ongoing illness and right now. Um, Cause we wanted to see if there were broad sort of phenotypes of, of long COVID because it's a very heterogeneous condition that were associated with cognitive deficits. And again, there was a lot of data across this, but just to present one of them, um, the in terms of looking at how, what symptoms people are experiencing right now, we could directly link how many neuro, the extent and severity of their neurological symptoms with performance on the memory factor. So um, the, some of the numbers are reversed in this figure, but basically the more, more severe neurological symptoms people reported experiencing, the worse they did on objective measures of memory. We also found there was associations between self-reported cognitive problems and objective performance on the cognitive tests. So, you know, as you might expect, people who reported forgetfulness did worse at memory um, and people who reported difficulty concentrating, which is quite a, uh, a fuzzy concept, um, generally did worse at a range of different cognitive tasks. Looking across um, the different things people reported, what we really found was that there was quite a consistent reduction in verbal memory ability. So when you looked at the specific tasks and the specific types of errors people were making, it was generally when you had combined some sort of need for memory and verbal information where you got the most consistent difference between the groups. So that's been a real whistle stop tour of what we did. We now have two papers out that were published this month, both in Frontiers in Aging Neuroscience, um, in a special issue on post-acute sequelae of uh, COVID, um, particularly looking at neurological care. Um, and we have some ongoing work in this area. Um, first of all, we're doing follow-ups. So the people in that study have been followed up for a year. Um, so we are analyzing that data right now to see particularly just how patterns change over time. Do people get better? But also how does post-infection vaccination impact things? Everyone in that sample was unvaccinated except like 10 people. Um, so what does anything change once they've had a vaccination? We're doing a next wave of the study, which is kind of, uh, would have been just a continuation of the study, but we learned so much in a year that we had to basically relaunch a whole new study because updating it with what we now knew. Um, and also that will be looking, recruiting from hospitals, but also looking at what pre-infection vaccination does. And there is some good news in the literature that it does seem like vaccination reduces the likelihood of developing long COVID. And we're also doing a similar study in children aged four to 12, because long COVID is something that exists in children and is a problem, but is not really investigated particularly. And there's no research that I know of, of cognition in long COVID in children. So yeah, there's a QR code here to the um, recruitment site. So if you want to take part, please do. Um, and I'll post the link in the chat afterwards. And just a quick note um, that in the child study, we will be making you, we are making use of the new tool in Gorilla, which is the game builder. So one of the tasks as a sort of uh, dipping the toe into the game builder water um, is a visual search task based on finding pirate treasure. Um, so the storyline is that a pirate has crashed into another pirate and they've both dropped all their treasure on the beach. And then it's a visual search task. You get told what you're looking for and then you get an array this is a nice, easy pop out one for four year olds um, where you have to find the, the particular coin in all of the mixed up treasure that's on the beach. And so far, I mean, we've only tested 25 kids, but so far, which is by far the most popular task in the list um, that we're testing the kids on. So it's working really, really well and really recommend it. Yeah, and so sorry to have done such a whistle stop tour, but um, yeah, I'd particularly like to thank all the people involved with this because this has been an unfunded study because the other thing about having no time is that there's no time to apply for any money. Um, so it's relied on a lot of really amazing volunteers and collaborators to whom I am extremely grateful. And Gorilla. <laughs> it's relied on Gorilla. <laughs> Uh, Lucy, that was fantastic. Thank you for showing. I've never gone into your research in so much detail. It's been wonderful to hear. Slightly worrying that 
COVID has such profound cognitive effects. I don't remember hearing that in the news at all. But one question to ask you would be, um, why, I mean, one of the things that struck me was that people's lived experience of their psychological symptoms does then show up in real life, in, in, in the tests. I, I, I it's not really surprising, but it's interesting. Yeah, it was one of those things that in some ways you'd be like, well, wh why is that a thing that you needed to test? Like people yeah. say they've got memory problems and then you like test their memory and they've got memory problems. Yeah. But it's because the patients reported to us, they were going to the GP and saying, I've got memory problems. And the GP said, no, no, you don't. You know, or it's, something. it's not yeah. so much like, you know, we don't care, but like, what do you want me to do with that? Yeah. Um, but, you know, but so where does this where does this take up? What, what are you hoping to learn from this linking of cognitive symptoms to more general symptoms how do, why is that an important part of the yeah. medical model so there's two big worries I think one yeah. is that even if you have minor deficits and you know these are minor these are hard tasks mm -hmm. that when you've got such a pro proportion of the population suffering um, those issues some of whom have minor issues some of whom have very severe issues that this has a profound impact on society if you know if everyone is just 20 percent less able to remember things that impacts on people's ability to do their jobs to look after their kids to manage their lives and in large numbers that matters the other thing is one of the reasons we're looking into the other symptom profiles is to try and understand the mechanism which again on online research you can't take a blood test but what you can do is do a detailed questionnaire mm. and linking the types of symptoms that might be reminiscent of inflammation versus the type of symptoms that may be reminiscent of having had a stroke helps us understand what might be causing cognitive deficits. One of the real worries is that all of the things we're looking at here are all beginning to point towards an increased vulnerability towards later development of dementia. And it's, it's I think it's really important for us to be able to log early on in otherwise young healthy people, where are we right now post-infection so that we can put it in context 20 years down the line when we see whatever the results are of it then so that we can mm. track this progress and see if there's anything if we know the mechanism we might be able to help if we don't know the mechanism then we just let it run and we'll see what happens and that's possibly not going to end well no brilliant if anybody else what i'd like people to do is into the chat can you take what was the one message you needed to hear from lucy today that you're going to take away to your research and then if you've got any questions please ask them in the q a and now we're going to have melissa who's going to be talking about uh, fake news. Hashtag COVID. Um, I, I don't seem to be able to share my screen. There's a green button at the bottom where you press Alt S, I think. No, I think, hold on, I think I actually just need to give it my laptop permission to do so. Okay. There are some questions in the chat for you, Lucy. Ah, yeah. Was, can you speak, can you I can see, see your screen. Yeah, that's fantastic. fantastic. Let's go. Melissa, let's go. Um, hi, everyone. Super excited to be here. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I will just be sort of reporting on some of the work that we do at the Cambridge Social Decision Making Research Lab here in Cambridge. Uh, all of this work that I'm reporting on today has obviously been done with a brilliant team behind me. So I'm just the face of it all. And couldn't and wouldn't possibly take all credit but to start off with I guess it's really important to kind of em emphasize and say that research continuously shows that our perceived ability to spot and resist misinformation our actual ability to do so um, there seems to be a massive discrepancy so I think I want to start off today with saying whether you're aware of it or not it is very very likely that you have come across believed and perhaps even shared misinformation in the in the past and maybe throughout this pandemic so I'm super excited to ex tell you about some of the research that we do um, and hope to, I guess, stop the spread of misinformation. Um, but to kind of just set the scene first, I suppose, um, many scholars argue that we now live in a post-truth world, that is a world where shared objective standards for truth have disappeared and where instead we continuously slip between facts, alternative facts, knowledge, opinion, and truth. Um, Unsurprisingly, the Oxford Dictionary picked post-truth as the word of the year in 2016. No idea what could have happened in 2016 to trigger that, but um, 
information seems so there's a there's a conundrum right the information seems to be more accessible than ever before and yet um although everything is just a quick google search away after all but and yet we are increasing we are witnessing increasing polarization where evidence-based decision making is sort of set aside and emotions and pre-existing beliefs seem to take precedence leaving scientifically agreed upon topics such as climate change or vaccine safety somehow up for debate right so and that all makes sense to some extent, uh, our brains, after all, are designed with biases and heuristics in place. Most of the time, these help us make really good and quick decisions in an increasingly overstimulating world. Um, but and at the end of the day, we all feel want to feel like we belong. So we seek out like minded people, people who look like us, sound like us, think like us, think, uh, act like us. And there's a wealth of cognitive research that illustrates illustrates the powerful forces of you know, confirmation biases, motivational thinking. Um, social identities when it comes to our beliefs and our behaviors. But what social media has done is that it has amplified and sort of accelerated these processes. And so we have, well, on the one hand, social media connects and strengthens and can be can play really pivotal uh, roles in, in social movements, for example. It also, social media platforms have also monetized our, our, our attention, are designed in a way that will keep us on there for as long as possible. So with each like, retreat, follow, unfollow we help train an algorithm that presents us with an increasingly personalized online sphere and unknowingly we create filter bubbles and echo chambers where our thoughts and beliefs remain unchallenged and instead perhaps are being celebrated um, and amplified and further polarized and radicalized as we enter our echo chambers um, so what can we do about it now that i've said that i've set the scene about it um, i think what, what's the I guess what's the matter with misinformation as well? Why should we share? Why should we care about it? Uh, we know that research so, shows that misinformation or unverified and false information tends to spread faster and further than any other kind of information, which means that any attempt to kind of debunk, retract, and undo the harms is at best an ambitious one. I think if we just think about the um, paper that suggests a link between autism and the vaccine from 20 something years ago now we're still trying to undo that harm although that has been debunked with a lot of science since then right so and in fact when it comes to the pandemic the who actually regarded the infodemic as potentially the most dangerous part about the pandemic and we can see it right we, we saw people drink bleach um, we saw misinformation around COVID-19 affect their risk perceptions, their compliance with guidelines, go up for demonstrations, uh, fall for conspiracy theories that all of this is just a hoax, not get vaccinated, burn down 5G towers. I guess in short, in order to kind of mitigate this global health crisis that we're in today, combating misinformation will be crucial. So I think it's important to kind of look at it from a psychological perspective and say all right can we can we do something about it um and we are not the first to answer this question uh, quite, uh, raise this question rather but mcguire and his colleagues back in the 60s at yale made a pivotal shift from studying how to make messages more persuasive to how to protect people from persuasion and they came up with something called inoculation theory and these brilliant illustrations to go with it which i find very amusing um but in essence, inoculation theory is just about, as the name suggests, based on an, an, a biological analogy of the immunization process, right? And I'm sure by now we're all sort of epidemiologists after the two years that we've had. But quickly, just to kind of re-emphasize, just as you would inject a weakened dosage of a pathogen to trigger the antibody production, the idea is that by exposing an inv individual to a weakened dose of persuasion and making them hyper aware of their susceptibility, we can trigger the mo motivational cognitive pr procedures to then build psychological antibodies. So when we come across misinformation, persuasion, propaganda, forms of manipulation in the future, we are ready to, to protect our attitudes against it. So that's, in essence, the theory. Uh, we took that theory and kind of changed it. I'm not going to go too deeply into the theoretical flaws, shortcomings, and gaps, but um, the way it was implemented was quite slow, but so in, in relation to COVID, it needed to be scalable and ideally 
easily um, spread in a way that would mimic uh, social media. So we have a shot at keeping up with, if not outpacing online misinformation. So we collaborated with the uh, UK cabinet office and developed a game called Go Viral. It's a five minute game where you are invited to drop all of your ethical pretenses and learn how to spread misinformation yourself, misinformation around COVID-19 to be specific. With each decision you get likes and credibility scores with bad decisions you lose on those respectively um and yeah it is a in, in a very fun environment a non-judgmental environment that doesn't tell you what to believe in and won't patronizingly tell tell you off for thinking that vaccines are unsafe um the game hopes to kind of expose the magic trick so you you won't fall for it again so when you know how these how these strategies the most some of the most common strategies in the, in the spread of misinformation are used the idea is hopefully when you come across them in the wild you'll note that they have been using them and you'll be able to resist it how did we test it we um ran actually two studies i think joe will link the paper we we've done a bunch of other games as well and continue to do this kind of gamified inoculation approach at our lab so there are lots of papers you can dig into if interested but the most recent one on go viral uh, we'll make sure that that's linked in the chat uh, we pre-registered it and did two studies so i'm just going to reflect on the the later one um, and had a pre-test and post-test where we asked people to assess the reliability of headlines. Some of them, ate, some of them were fake, some of them were real. Um, also asked them how confident they are in their ability to, to kind of assess that reliability and whether or not they would share it online. And then we, had, we put them in different uh, treatment conditions randomly, assigned them to search. So they either played go viral Whoops. They either played Go Viral or they were shown UNESCO's infographics uh, that were developed to fight COVID-19 misinformation. So more of a passive scroll through the infographics that they would naturally come across online. Or to kind of control for the gamification effect, we asked them to play Tetris. Uh, we also asked participants, um, oh, we use Prolific Academic, by the way, for, for that. But we asked the participants on there to leave us a comment. And one of my favorites was, uh, I can't believe what the University of Cambridge has has fallen to. They've just paid me to play Tetris for 15 minutes. So um, really, really sad or something of that sort. So that person doesn't know they were in the control group, but yes. And then in the post test, we asked them to assess the reliability of those headlines. Again, we also looked at a few more things that are theoretically of interest to my PhD um, and had a bunch of um, demographics and then we followed up with them and showed them new previously unseen items to rate a week later to kind of see whether the inoculation effect that we were hoping to see would persist for at least a week. Um, just kind of to give you an example, so the fake items that we use in the item assessment task were roughly dividable into the three techniques covered and go viral so people learned how to use emotional language they learned how to use a fake expert to make their content seem more credible and then also learned how to kind of stir up and develop and make a conspiracy theory go viral um, they saw a bunch of headlines for each of these for each of these uh, strategies and then the, the real ones were just ones that uh, full fact or other fact checking websites were tweeting so we kind of blocked out the source for all of them um, and had real real stuff in terms of fact-checked real tweets in the past and these were all made up because we wanted to make sure that there's no memory count found and people wouldn't go oh i remember reading something about that that must be true um yep here's the experimental conditions some results inoculated individuals perceived misinformation as significantly less reliable whoops see that here and here, I think this is really important as well, because we see that uh, the effect was only, it only occurred for the fake news items and not the real ones, which is really important for us because we don't want people to just get cynical and disregard everything as less reliable, right? We want people to be able to engage online or with their newspaper and then kind of differentiate 
between um, information that uses manipulative strategies to information that does not. Um, inocul inoculated individuals are also more confident in their judgments. We found that in the Goral paper, but also in a paper from 2020, where we also show that the boost, the confidence boost, um, occurs in the right direction. So only people who actually got better at differentiating between manipulative versus um, information that does not, or fake and real information, only those actually also experience the confidence boost, which is very reassuring. And they are less willing to share the misinformation items. And these effects persist over time. So we see that here with the one week follow-up here for go viral in the middle each and also on a separate paper led by one of my colleagues we show that with regular quote unquote booster effects this inoculation effect persists up until at least three months so we keep following up with them and show that they actually are pretty good and persist to be good at it um, I guess the big question that kind of leads from there is can we spread resistance against misinformation and kind of just how herd immunity works, the idea would be to kind of work towards psychological herd immunity where enough people are inoculated that misinformation doesn't get very far to begin with. Um, with that in mind, we designed Go Viral because it is freely accessible, it is online, it's already has been um, translated into I think 13 languages now. At the end of it, you get a score and you are encouraged to challenge your friends to out outdo your score. So I think we've set it up in a way that would hopefully make it more, much more scalable than the traditional inoculation treatments from the 60s up until now, pretty much. And where do we go from here? I mean, uh, I really rushed through all of that. And I know that there's a lot of work happening on misinformation from different disciplines and, and there's algorithmic stuff. There, the tech giants have their own approaches. There's a lot of conversations that need to be ha had on regulation. There's an educational approach. There's a reactive approach in terms of fact checking and debunking. Um, I think it's just important to kind of emphasize that there needs to be a multi-layered defense mechanism against misinformation and hopefully that, yeah, that psychology is at its core of it. Um, yeah, thank you to all our collaborators, our funders, my brilliant supervisor who lets me be on, on projects like these. And yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to email me after or just shoot me a message on Twitter or something. You'll find your way. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. That was amazing. I mean, please in the chat, tell you, could people say what they took away from that talk? For me, I took away, you know, COVID misinformation is a big thing, but you've given us some really good strategies for protecting ourselves. Oh, and they're sort of obvious, look at the shores, make sure you're not being emotionally manipulated. Is somebody trying to sell you a conspiracy theory? Because gosh, those are fun, but not real. So that's really helpful just today. And I think Claire's going to try and link everybody up with the game. So that if they want to go inoculate themselves first, of course, and then disseminate it around their family so that we can each live in bubbles, which are a little bit safer, that would be great. Um, Melissa, I did have a question for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was an interesting tweet a while ago from the woman who ran the CBC saying we weren't expecting people to turn down the vaccine. We weren't expecting psychology the be to be the critical thing here. We thought once we came up with the answer, it would all be fine. And, um, you know, climate, climate change, big surprise. But we're seeing the same problem here with, um, with uh, COVID. So why is the psychology going to be ultimately even more important than the medical side? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. I think when it comes to vaccine hesitancy too, it's such a complex question in particular, because depending on where you are in the world, um, the psychology of or towards vaccine safety will change a lot. But in terms of misinformation and why psych the psychological component is important in there. So if we kind of take a step back and go, all right, so there have been legislations, for example, Germany had a legislation where social media platforms had 24 hours for clearly illegal content to take it down, otherwise they would face a hefty fine, right? And that has been scrutinized for breaking basic rights for freedom of expression and so forth. So legislations will be walking on a slippery slope in terms of all of those rights. We know that, for example, our work with WhatsApp that we've done, I couldn't 
touch on today. We've done some work with WhatsApp um, on misinformation that was spreading in India, is still spreading in India, and, and leads to loads of violence and mob lynchings and so forth. And before they kind of consulted um, scholars around the world, including us, their first reaction was to take down the forwarding button, reduce the group size, the group chat size on, uh, on their app in India. And what one paper sh like powerfully shows is that that simply delayed the propagation of misinformation. It didn't stop it. It just made it more difficult. So if we don't get to the core as to why people fall for misinformation around COVID in particular, and generally around times of crises when we are trying to make sense of something, um, if we don't get to the core of it, then that won't work. We know that content moderation in general, and we're seeing this again, I am from Germany, so I have a lot of things to say about Germany, but we see this again where, you know, Facebook and Twitter will take stuff down and then the very right, far right movement will take that off and start an end to end encrypted chat on Signal and spread it on there. So content moderation will only go so far because if there is an incentive, if there is a psychological motive behind wanting to share that with others, they will find a way. Um, so I think really understanding why this happens will be a crucial puzzle piece to stopping it and combating it. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Melissa. If anybody's got any questions for Melissa, put them in the Q&A or reach out to Melissa. She's not going to be here for very long. Or reach out to yeah. Melissa on Twitter or on LinkedIn. Uh, yeah. She's a very approachable, lovely person. Ask questions. Everyone loves talking Thanks about Thanks for having research. me, Jeff. Yeah, lovely. you're very welcome, Melissa. Um, next, we're going to have Maximilian. Max who's going to be talking, it's got a slightly different angle, but it's equally fascinating. I think it's more about our introspective experience of how we experienced this living with COVID. Um, we've all gone through this incredible, do share your slides, Max, so you're ready to, mm -hmm. to start chatting. We all went through this incredible experience for two years, which shaped us and changed us in ways that were utterly unexpected. Um, and Max Brillian is going to tell us a bit about that. <clears throat> Yes, thank you for having me. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, talk about this uh, project. It's about uh, time perception during the COVID times. Um, so this uh, project began right at the onset of the COVID pandemics and the lockdowns that occurred in particular in France, it was very strict and everybody was at home and everybody had their uh, temporal routines disturbed. Uh, so <clears throat> because there is, um, because there is uh, science showing that the subjective time is one of the most malleable aspects of our experience and that it is affected by our uh, inner state as well as by our environment, um, Virginie van Vassenhove, uh, who is the leader of this uh, project, uh, started to uh, build uh, a crazy um, set of behavioral experiments. Uh, she started this um, right at the beginning of the uh, lockdown and got on board um, a huge team of about 30 uh, people worldwide, all uh, part of a, a very strong uh, for. Um, a network called the Timing Research Forum. I am personally not a research, uh, like a, a timing researcher, uh, and I got involved in this quite by chance, I would say. Uh, my partner happens to be part of this network, and uh, one day she was like, okay, Virginie got into this crazy idea of running a huge set of experiments. Uh, we need someone like you to handle the data. And that's where I, I came in. So the Blur's Day study is uh, 30 fairly well-known uh, tasks and questionnaires uh, probing time perception and temporal cognition. So questionnaires like uh, how long ago uh, did you think the lockdown began? Or uh, can you uh, tap the keyboard regularly and uh, following this cue? Uh, or uh, how's your mood today? And so on. Lots of questions. I am not uh, uh, into this part of the, the, the project. And so I'm not going to talk to, too much about the results of this. It's currently being explored. Uh, what I um, what I did was basically bringing this data to the researchers and bringing it um, uh, yeah together. 
We also took uh, some objective measures, Google's mobility reports and our world in data um, stringency indices that are uh, open and that were merged to the with the data. Okay, 12 countries, four to five sessions, uh, meaning experiments in Gorilla's um, uh, terminology, more than uh, 2,800 2, uh, participants spread all over the world. Um, but thanks to Gorilla's very strict uh, um, format and uh, data, we were able to mer merge all this data. And I will uh, tell you exactly, or not exactly, but uh, some tricks that we had to uh, deploy in order to do this, because it was not an easy uh, endeavor. Um, OK, so just to showcase a little more uh, what uh, happened, so we had uh, 11 different countries, five different sessions highlighted with uh, colors uh, here, and a bunch of measures. Uh, so these uh, stringency and uh, uh, mobility indices that I uh, told you about throughout the experiment that ran from uh, March 2020 to October 21, last, uh, last October. So that, that's the data that's uh, shown here uh, with various recruitment uh, waves. Okay, the demographics were easy to extract and I'm not going to, to talk too much about it. Oops, so this presentation will end with uh, some recommendations. But before that, I'll uh, highlight the fact that my mission in this project was so not to think about uh, the tasks and design the project. I came in after the data collection had begun, trying to bring all these uh, data sets together. So I'm handling and serving the, the collected data and trying to put it in shape so that everybody can use it. And uh, timing researchers are um, more interesting in time perception than in handling data. So it was good. I think uh, my contribution was appreciated. Um, yeah, a little uh, representation of how uh, the timing researchers may feel uh, in front of this huge data set. And I, uh, my, goal, my role was to bring them to a more uh, smiley face. Um, so about this presentation, we're going to talk about how we dealt with these 30 different tasks from 10 different countries, uh, as many, uh, so we had about 40 or so uh, experiments in Gorilla terms. So these data sets that you can download at once. So bringing all of them together was a diff difficulty. So the challenges, I'm going to tell you a little bit about it, the solutions we found and a few recommendations toward the end. So my first task, uh, self-described, I must say, it was completely voluntary. Nobody was paid in this uh, in this project, uh, was to merge and serve the raw data. So what you download from Gorilla is uh, zip files, one for each of the experiments that you uh, design and one for each version of this experiment that you may have modified. You can see that this uh, very experiment, I don't remember which country it was, had up to 57 different uh, versions. So there was a lot to uh, merge. This in itself was not so difficult. Uh, one of the main uh, difficulties was uh, that some of the uh, participating countries had modified some of the, the experiments so that they did not have the same names uh, inside the data files. And uh, if you've done a little bit of this, you realize that uh, it's a problem when this, the column that you want to merge across uh, countries is not the same. So the trick I, I found for this was, and I, I skip on this because this is only interesting to, uh, to those who are actually doing the, this kind of uh, thing. Uh, but the trick I found was to use a Google spreadsheet online where I had people enter those codes that they find in their in their data and that when they define their experiments they entered all of these and I made them correspond to one name that was more explicit uh, human readable in a, in a sense uh, so you know like self preference test first session third run uh, this uh, is uh, easier understood than uh, than uh, a bunch of letters that change across countries. Okay, so these, uh, yeah, using spreadsheets was absolutely essential uh, here, and those spreadsheets being acceptable, accessible by everybody was also quite uh, important. Um, 
Then I started uh, serving the data to the, the researchers. So they, they'd send me these types of files and I'd send them uh, tables that were more uh, explicit uh, in, in terms of uh, what's in it, basically. And we use an own cloud server. So that's kind of a Dropbox, you know, this thing you can send a link and everybody can access it. That was very easy. And I think when I, uh, when I uh, what scored the most uh, points in uh, in this uh, group of researchers when, was when I actually decided to uh, create a Shiny app for this. A Shiny app is just a, a very simple uh, web server that uh, can display a few questions, you know, like which country do you want to uh, download, which uh, uh, tasks do you want, what session, and which additional covariates you want to add to your data. Click update, press download, and you have it. This was very much appreciated and very easy once uh, this whole uh, data set was um, created, uh, as I explained uh, before. Um, the code is available. Uh, feel free to get in touch if you have any questions how to do this. Uh, there are lots of tutorials, but I can uh, help you know, for the specifics of, uh, um, of time of um, uh, Gorilla in, in here. Uh, this really made them happy and made us uh, want to actually write a paper very quickly about uh, this database paper that uh, was probably posted by uh, Joe already uh, on in the chat. It's in uh, in revision right now. Another uh, challenge was inter international uh, data. Basically, having these questionnaires from in twelve different languages, more or less, or perhaps a little less, because lots were several were using English or French. Um, but uh, yeah, having people uh, so combining these different languages was difficult. Two types of problems I had. One was mapping different categorical responses across languages and the other was translating actual text responses we decided to translate them all to english uh, this was um, uh, yeah and done again here with um uh, with uh, google sheets basically or online sheets should i say um so we collected the we, for this we collect all responses put them in a long spreadsheet ask uh, on a public spreadsheet um, and ask uh, researchers to basically uh, fill in a translated uh, column that was empty at first and they came in and okay uh, this translates to a strict format um, okay so again very technical quite boring for most people but uh, uh, quite useful in that uh, for the for the research you know Obviously, when you deal with text responses, you have people answering the way you ask them. So, uh, you know, with a strict format and others that explain uh, their, you know, how, how it went. Uh, I was very focused and uh, I lost track of time. And I would say, yeah, it took me about 30 to 35 minutes when the question was just give us a number. And this one in uh, Greek was a bit more difficult also for me to understand. I don't speak Greek. Uh, the other uh, challenge with um, translating data across languages was to make uh, experiments that had the same, um, you know, like scales, like from, uh, you know, like a low to high uh, agreement in a questionnaire or in this task, it was, uh, okay, so how much do you perceive and so on. It was a, a delay discounting task. Some of you may be familiar with this. Um, so again, I put them in a spreadsheet and had them uh, sort uh, all of these. For all of these tasks, uh, I used uh, RStudio and the Tidyverse. This again sounds quite technical and is much less fascinating than all the talks I heard uh, today, but it's quite uh, uh, impressive how uh, this uh, software allows to do uh, incredible uh, stuff with very complex data. And um, yeah, and I'm already uh, to, at the end of uh, this intervention. Um, you're welcome to go and download any of the, the code that uh, we created for this. Uh, there's an open science framework uh, repository for the whole uh, experiment. That's also quite a big challenge of uh, having such a large group of researchers, but I'm, uh, you know, like I'm preaching uh, the like, People are already convinced by that, I'm sure. Um, yes, I uh, think I'm already uh, to the end of my uh, presentation. 
the first paper is under review. It's a resource paper, and we are uh, excited. It, we are hoping it will get accepted uh, soon. Thank you for your attention. I'm audience for your eventual questions, if you have any. Max, thank you so much. That was fascinating. Yeah, um, I thought how you were using Google Sheets to get your collaborators to give you the information you need mm -hmm. so you could then read that into R mm -hmm. and then process their data and hand mm -hmm. it back to them. It's so clever that sort of, um, I mean, we know we always talk about reproducible workflows and then you're taking it a step further of creating these sections in your workflow that people could update with the data that you need or put the translations in that you need it's a really nifty approach mm -hmm. to scaling up your research so that you can do it in a short period of time so mm -hmm. that's what i'm going to take away from this talk everybody else if there was something that you learned in this talk from max please put it in the chat it's really nice for the speakers to know um how they've shaped your thinking um, I had a question for you. It's like, what would you do differently in retrospect going back now mm -hmm. that you've got to the very end of it? I know I often get to the end of the data analysis and I'm like, oh, you know what I should have done at the beginning? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, my, my main uh, con uh, like my main um, recommendation here is to get, uh, like if you're running such a huge uh, uh, thing, get someone with uh, an eye like uh, I showed you uh, today, like a technical eye on your data collection, on those spreadsheets. Don't change names when you translate uh, things. Don't change what the users don't see. You know, like we had people naively translate uh, column names uh, of those spreadsheets. You know, like and I don't, I wasn't part of the design of the the, the task, so I don't exactly know how it went, and I came in a bit late. So that's also like my my main point here. Um, get someone. Uh, to look at this right from the start. Um, something I don't know, and I have a question for you, Joe. Mm -hmm. uh, is there in Gorilla a way to uh, make some input control or like you know, control that people enter what we ask them to enter? Something rightly formatted. For example, I ask you, uh, give me the, the duration of the task uh, in you know, minutes, seconds. Um, can you control? That people enter uh, the, something and not format. and not yeah, yeah and not tell them they're they're they, they, yeah exactly. Um, there are there are some that we've been creating more recently, mm -hmm. very specific ones. Um, the that you can use just straight in the questionnaire builder. Mm -hmm. Um, the other way you can do it is with the code editor. So there is this code editor task, and so when you want something like that, it can be. It's like no no no, I am just because it's one of the things that's nice about Gorilla is the flexibility to go, actually for this bit, I'm not gonna use the Gorilla tooling because I need it to do exactly the thing mm -hmm. that I've got in my mind. Mm -hmm. So then you could code it up. So you're like, no, 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 I want the time like this and I want your height like this and I want your weight like this, not mm -hmm. a different way. Yeah. So that is possible. I think with the new tooling that we've got coming, so we've just launched Task Builder 2 and later on this year, there's going to be um, Questionnaire Builder 2. That's a really great suggestion that I'm gonna mm -hmm. take back to the product team is give researchers ability to say, I actually want you to ask, answer this question in only this format um and force force that that compliance because mm -hmm. i think that that i know that problem firsthand from yeah. data analysis when somebody enters the answer in the wrong format you're like you messed yeah, up my it, whole data processing pipeline i spent so I much time <laughs> i yeah. spent so much time dealing with those uh you know like uh, answers like yeah, yeah. oh no no Type oh, la, la. Yeah. <laughs> and it's that six sigma thing isn't it that um when you've got your data set is that large and you've got that many participants yeah. it might only yeah. be in, like there each is, participant only does it once but is everything all, is falling one. over the whole time exactly and it's so infuriating i would data processing mm -hmm. people yeah. sort of go oh no i like i've got all my data and then they jump yeah. to the results and that data processing bit is one of the biggest jobs mm -hmm. uh, that people come to and very little is spoken about it as mm -hmm. a job and as a discipline Mm -hmm. And in fact, one of the things we're thinking of working on, uh, Max, and I might want to talk to you about this separately, uh, is building a whole data post-processing, well, pre-processing, post-processing flow into Gorilla so mm -hmm. that you can do all of the stuff you were doing in Gorilla and go, I'd like this data and that data and this and this mm -hmm. comes together like yeah. this. And then you get out the data in the end because we've yeah. got it all on the server anyway. Mm -hmm. We might as well do that heavy lifting before, before it comes through. But that's not for this year, next year, I hope. Um, <laughs> Anybody, any questions for Max, please put them in the Q&A. Um, but other than that, uh, wait, wait, uh, Rodrigo, would Gorilla consider adding synchronization tasks in the future? Currently still work around using reaction times and lots of error prone calculation. Uh, Rodrigo, can you just say more, more what you mean by a synchronization task? Or maybe Max knows. No. No. 
for adding a synchronization task for for what? Ah, um, I think. Okay, Rodrigo is part of the the yeah. the birthday team. So um, one perhaps what he means is basically trying to uh, like knowing exactly at what. Uh, uh, what kind of lag may be between the button press and your and the time it took to uh, actually record the experiment and the, the response, things like that. I think it's technically challenging to do without an actual physical measure of the time when the button was pressed. But um, yeah, maybe you. Well, have... we can only know when we think the button was pressed. But yeah. I think uh, Rodrigo is saying like keeping pace to, with music. Um, and I think in the new game builder tool, for sure, you'd be able to play an audio track in the background and have people press a button in time with that. And then mm -hmm. you could look at whether they're in sync. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the difficulty would be knowing, are they in sync or not? <laughs> and it's like, you'd be able to see whether they're, whether the gaps are the right distance, but you wouldn't know whether there was a difference, but then you wouldn't know whether they're hearing it slightly delayed in their headphones. There are so many places the delay could come from. So it'd be difficult to know, but you know, you'd be able to assume that they were doing the best job they could and, and then use that measure mm -hmm. of how good that synchronization, mm -hmm. how, rather than how synchronized they were from stimulus and response, how consistent they were. And if you varied the beat, did they vary it in the right way? Like if you made it longer, mm -hmm. Could they do it a longer distance yeah. if you put it shorter could they do it a shorter different parts and how accurate whether their accuracy remained the same regardless of the tempo of the beat would i think the way that you would get a measure uh you need response mm. size which are not reaction time yeah. um but yes you, i mean what you'd get is the timestamp for each of the button presses and then from that you can work out the gaps yeah. um so with that, everyone, I hope thank you so much for coming and being order, our audience today to listen about this amazing array of COVID research. We've had a whistle stop tour around um, Jane's research and Lucy's research, Melissa's and finally Max's research. I hope you've taken away some useful insights into how to do what's possible online and how to do research online and how fast it can be, how expansive it can be, how socially useful it can be um, and how uh, fascinating it can be that these on one topic, we've had four completely different presentations. So also how varied it can be once you can reach these huge populations, these different populations and start using the world as your your petri dish i guess um today we had our gorilla presents about covid next month we're going to have a gorilla presents all about participant engagements how to make the most engaging tasks for your participants so that you get the best quality data from them that's going to be on the 28th of april and i think claire's going to share a link now so if you think that would be interesting for your research please go and register for it um, we will be teaching you the tips and tricks for making sure that you get best quality data, which I know is the concern for a lot of researchers taking research online. If you want to follow me there, then on Twitter, I am at Evershow, um, which is like this. I'll copy it into the chat or you can follow Gorilla Psych. Uh, Claire, can you put the Gorilla Psych tag into the chat as well? Uh, that's where we typically share news of our next uh, Gorilla Presents. Uh, we will also be sending out an email of the recording of this webinar and a sign up link for the next one. So do watch out for that. And with that, thank you and good night. Thank you for being an amazing audience. Um, we'll see you all again soon. Thank you. Bye.